talk about blockchain. Um, obviously, in the context of how can we use it to achieve social impact, what's its role in that, and you know, how much hype is there around it. So we have two really exciting um, speakers. Um, we'll be joined by David, who will moderate the discussion. Um, we have Kathleen, who's the co-founder of Tezos, um, you probably heard of um, making headlines recently um, for their ICO with 232 million, approximately. Um, and we also have um, Te, um, who is the founder of Taikin. Um, so Te is someone who's actually um, felt the impacts of what it's like to live without um, a legal identity. Um, and Taikin is um, a company dedicated to ensuring that everybody has a legal identity. Um, so thank you so much, guys, uh, for, for doing this. And I'll invite you all to uh, come up now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for sticking around for the, uh, till the end of the day. We're, we're on the, the home stretch, and we've kept um, some of the best to last. Thank you, Ben. Um, so I'm mostly just going to sit here as stage dressing and let these two brilliant people talk about their work. Um, but I'm going to start with just a question for Tay um, and then one for Kathleen. I want to hear each of your stories and sort of how you came to do what you do now and are in the sort of most hyped technology of hyped technologies. So uh, let's start with Tay. Um, I know your business was born out of firsthand experience. Yep. So could you tell us a bit about your story and how, it, uh, and how you came to be uh, running Taiken. Sure. So you want the short version or the long version? Um, the, we have nine minutes okay. um, nice. to have this discussion. So this yeah. short version. All right. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tay. I'm co-founder of uh, Taiken.tech. I was uh, born in Kuwait in 1990. The Gulf War erupted. My family fled to Lebanon. In that process, I lost my birth certificate. So when I came to the Netherlands to work as a, what we call a knowledge worker, or for the other part of the people who think I'm an economic migrant, uh, I applied for my driving license, and they wrote on it that I'm born in unknown. So uh, 2014, my work contract expired. I was born in Kuwait, but my father does not own an oil well. He's not Kuwaiti. He's Syrian, so I carry his nationality, his Syrian nationality. The only chance to stay in the Netherlands was to apply for asylum. So I thought, OK, I live in the Netherlands. I pay my taxes. I have my dog, my house. I cheer for the, my local team, Adu Danaq. I even have a football subscription there. So it must be very easy to identify me and allow me to stay in the Netherlands. But that process took two years. So 29, actually it was 28 September 2014, I was sleeping at home. 29 September 2014, I'm sharing a room with 12 people I don't know, same bathroom, same shower, and just like life flipped. At the same time, then I realized, okay, it's not only me today in this camp, in this facility that I am unknown. We have almost 1,500 people in that camp where more than 70% came without identities. They don't have birth certificates. They didn't have land titles, academic certificates. So being an early adopter of cryptocurrencies 2012, I realized the potential of blockchain in the identity space. And in the room E18, we started the validation process of whether blockchain does fit in the identity space as a Prob probable solution, and not a 100% solution. This was the, the journey. Awesome. Thank you, Tay. And it's weird. This clock is moving faster than it should. I'm telling you. I've been, lo I've been looking at it as Tay talks, and the seconds are ticking down faster. And the nice thing about this panel is I'm actually in charge. So we're going to have the conversation until it's done, because you guys have come in from across the world. So Kathleen, you have an interesting story as well. Um, tell, tell me about your journey with Tezos. And well, well, well Tay is a hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> I, I was born to two nice white people in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Slightly I, different. You know, yeah, I've, no one ever kind of questioned. I, I get into places that I probably shouldn't because, you know, I'm just a <laughs> generic UK looking person. Um, but in any case, um, so my, my journey with like cryptocurrency in general starts pretty early on. Um, my good friend uh, Perry runs a cryptography mailing list for big 
Bitcoin was announced. Um, and I have a, for, you know, unfortunate draft in my inbox saying like, I should check out this Bitcoin thing. Seems pretty interesting from like 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, but I got into it in like 2011. And, uh, and basically my husband and I um, both really enjoy arguing, um, sorry, debating. Um, and, uh, and, and basically we really liked Bitcoin, but there was like something, a certain je ne sais quoi about like what we didn't exactly like about the way it was constructed. And what we, what we came upon was that governance was really the answer. So Bitcoin is a really powerful and, and interesting piece of software, um, but it lacks a native mechanism to upgrade itself. And so the end result of this has been like a lot of stasis in Bitcoin development and a lot of infighting and um, very informal ways to like actually move the currency forward in terms of technical development and feature building. Um, so Tezo seeks to address this by adding a governance layer or a native upgrade mechanism to the, um, to the blockchain. Um, so uh, as, as I think the, uh, uh, I was introduced, like the project itself has raised a lot of money and, and uh, a lot of people really want to be a part of the network, which will be launching later on this month. So um, if you see me looking furiously at my phone, it, it's all good intentions. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So the next question is about how to scale blockchain in spite of its complexity and maintain its disruptive power. So um, the team has put together a really good question and I'm going to read it verbatim so it, it actually makes sense. So let's face it, blockchain is not the first technology that people have pre predicted are going to turn the balance of power into their head, in, uh, turn the balance of power on their head. And what we've seen in the past is that very often these new disruptive technologies end up mainly benefiting though with the most benefiting those with the most privilege and power. So, how do we make sure that blockchain is actually scaled, the blockchain is actually scaled and applied for the benefit of the majority and the most marginalized of people, especially considering the complexity of the technology? makes it inherently quite inaccessible. So how do you scale blockchain so that it benefits everyone and not just a privileged few, I think is the succinct way to put that. Yeah, I, well, I think that most technologies that we enjoy today, and frankly, that have helped out people the most, started off with rich people using it, like cell phones by far. Um, my dad had one in the 80s that was like this big. Um, and now, you know, people in Kenya basically use it to, to move money around. It's so pretty. It's Elon Musk build the, the, the fancy sports car. You get the rich people to buy it. Well, Elon Musk also built the rocket ship that can be reused, right? right? So, like, you know, that's all great for people, and it's because economies of scale are, are, are such that, like, you do need this sort of technological innovation to come first, and a lot of times you do have, like, um, risk-taking capital that kind of fuels and propels things forward. Now, mind you, for every, you know, <laughs> for every, uh, you know, for every cell phone company, there's probably, like, some other, you know, series of horror stories, but having um, wealthy people take, like, that risk-bearing mm -hmm. um, step is actually, I think, what yields the greatest impact for everyone. <laughs> I think everyone agrees that this technology is most useful when many people use it. It follows Metcalf's law. The size of the network overall is really what drives the value of it. Um, and so I think there's strong incentives to make it accessible to people. The real question is, like, um, how, do you, how do you kind of coordinate on those things and how do you make sure that they're realized very quickly? And that's kind of the principal idea of Tezos is, like, if you can build in technology that helps scale the blockchain, like um, ZK Stark, so on and so forth, what you get is, is a more accessible and more use, useful version of it so that you can actually have, like, a refugee use it and not have to worry about... Um, their internet connection, so on and so forth, and build like mesh networks and cool stuff like that. So, um, you know, I, I do think like overwhelmingly the arc of history uh, bends towards like you know rich people kind of have to bear this risk at first, um, and then hopefully it, it goes to the the masses uh, if it's a successful idea. Got it. Um, so blockchain for inclusion, Tay. Tell me about how your how, how Tykin works and and how it actually um, what's the practical reality of what someone without an identity does to Claim one. Well, in our uh, journey, there were some, uh, I think fail is a big word, but let's say there were some failing moments where we thought we are going to take the government in our uh, process and we're going to include them in this innovation and we build what we call a birth registration blockchain where we are able to issue birth certificates on such a technology. Now, we were hit by the reality that governments won't adopt such an application because simply by law, birth certificates must be issued on paper. So in our demo day at the Rockstart Accelerator, no one came to approach us and no one offered us an investment. Uh, 1,200 applications were gone through the accelerator 
10 were chosen, 9 got an investment, Tyken didn't. <laughs> so this is where we realized, okay, the concept of digital identity, of legal digital identities, is far away from happening, legally. But there is another side for the story. We saw in our validation process that in a village like Malawi, we have 90% vaccination rates. That means there's an aid worker coming to a village, identifying babies under the age of five and giving them a vaccine. Birth registration rates under 10%. So why is this happening? Why can't we have, why can't we count them at least? Why can't we say they exist? Because once you say they exist, once you give them a type of an identity that they're able to take a vaccine, go to school, get a food voucher, do their basic human needs, then you're not only protecting them or you're not only offering them school education and money, but you're actually protecting them, protecting them from sex trafficking, from exploitation and many other stuff. So back to the Syrian uh, case, children in Turkey, the Syrian refugees, the children Syrian refugees in Turkey, they are at high risk of working in the child labor industry. So again, why is the reason? Because they are born in camps and they are unregistered. So what we do at Tykin is we build a distributed attestation infrastructure. So it's a simply a technological innovation where we allow trusted community members to attest for someone else's identity and give in an application an immutable proof that this person exists. There is no authority in that, but there is a concrete uh, reputation based on this identity. So look at, for example, again in Africa, you have the chief village, he is the leader. People trust him and they listen to him and they take his word for, let's say, for granted. We allow him, instead of having this huge book and writing identities in it, he can do that on an iPad. But we make sure that this data can never be lost and can never be tampered, providing what we call the resilient identity. Resiliency being tamper-proof and tamper-evident. So no one can lose it and no one can fraud it. Great. Kathleen, you were just in Sweden or Norway. Recently. Norway. Norway. Yeah. I knew it was. I knew it was somewhere in the north. A peaceful to, place. To talk yeah. about the implications of the blockchain on displaced people. So is, is, am I remembering correctly? Yeah. I mean, um, I, I was at the Human Rights Foundation's uh, Freedom Forum, which I recommend you know everyone go to if you're if you're also going to Founders Forum. Excellent. Um, but uh, yeah. So I, I mean, for our end, I think it's a little bit more personal. My husband uh, is the uh, child of a. a Jew who was, um, you know, sent to the camps in World War II, and uh, in in the Jewish tradition, like there's a lot of there's a lot of emphasis on putting capital on your head, whether it's like doing skilled labor, or whether it's like learning the violin over the piano. Like you need to be able to like kind of replace yourself um, pretty quickly and, and make value not through land ownership because things like this are normally seized. So like property and and physical capital are like not as valued in Jewish communities. Um, it, the reason that's the case is like they tend to be historically persecuted. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the nice and provocative thing about blockchain technology is that you can actually like carry your wealth in your head. All you have to remember is you know a, a few character strings and and you're good. Um, and this is like uh, uh, the asymmetry that this presents into like um, the ability to oppress people. I think is really radical. Um, and so like it's very easy to fixate on on blockchain technology as like kind of this wild speculative you know. Uh, sort of financial future, um, but I think it also offers something really powerful to the people who are like most vulnerable. Yeah, um, identities and yeah. capital without borders. So that's all good and well, right? It's a distributed ledger. There's some uh, so, some really exciting applications to it, but there's also some pretty potentially big unintended consequences that can stem from it, these negative externalities. So in sitting here, it strikes me that if you're putting information on a distributed ledger that everyone can see and access, and that information is inherently private about identity, for example. H how do you square those two things to ensure that the wrong people aren't using your good technology for bad ends? So maybe talk about some of the un con unintended consequences on vulnerable, vulnerable groups for each of your technologies, if, if one applies. Maybe, Tay, you could yeah, start. I can, I can start with that. Actually, I'll build off from what Kathleen was talking about in the uh, 
World War II, there was in Amsterdam the, uh, the genocide against the Jewish community. Now, how did this happen? If we go back and dig in the reasons on how was the Nazis or how did Hitler was able to identify the Jews living in Amsterdam and living in the Netherlands in general, it was because of technology, a technology developed by IBM called the punch card. And it was a very perfect piece or very perfect tool to build a civil registry. Now, the disadvantage here was its centralization. That means there is one person, which was Hitler at that time, who was able to access the registries and identify people. And the second thing is the information was not encrypted. So again, this person can flip through the books and read names, addresses, whatever. Welcome to blockchain. We do two things. We distribute this ledger. So I never go on stage without my ledger. It's simply a book where we write in it important stuff. On the blockchain, we're writing encrypted messages. And we are not taking my name and encrypting it and registering it. There's a more complex process that happens. It is more of a reference that this validation of me and the midwife or me and the doctor has happened at a point in time. There are disadvantages, of course. Now, the scale of a bad thing happening on blockchain is much lower than it could happen on any database now. And I think Equifax is one of the most prominent examples that stick in our heads on how centralized ledgers can go wrong. So one thing that we took in consideration is privacy. Not only because GDPR is enforced now by law, which took them around 20 years to think and to enforce a law on privacy, it's just because it's a simple human right. And someone can lose his device that identify him. Someone can lose his identifier. It's not the end of the world. How, more than half, actually. I used to say that half of the Syrian population, but more than half of the Syrian population has lost their identities. Why? Because we all saved it in one place. Now, we were talking about climate change a few minutes before. Well, natural disasters are also on the rise. And the the percentage of a natural disaster happening in St. Martin, for example, where we work with the Dutch Red Cross, is also increasing. So instead of the whole population losing their identities, maybe few will lose their identifiers and their phones. There is a downturn, but it's not as dangerous as we think, simply because we need, including myself and the journey that I started with, we need to get more educated on what goes on the blockchain and how are we doing that? Got it. Kathleen, unintended consequences of Tezos. Uh, I've, there's some, been a lot on me. Um, <laughs> I don't think it, we've, uh, we've exposed anyone else to the unintended consequences of Tezos, thankfully. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think that just in general, um, the education in this space is really horrible. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis in talking about things like price, so on and so forth, whereas the technology itself is extraordinarily immature and for, in many ways it's not even um, remotely useful for some of the applications that people uh, hype. So I think that what's really important for blockchains to get right is uh, privacy preservation and transactions. Um, there's a number of different uh, cryptocurrencies that do this, like Zcash and Monero. I think popularizing that and making it more accessible is really important. For example, Zcash is one of the few um, a few blockchains that um, allows you to basically obfuscate your transactions and preserve your privacy. And yet, very few people actually use this function because they're all here be dragons when it comes to um, when it comes to anything with a, a um, uh, level of um, you know more sophisticated encryption attached to it, and I think that's um, you know partially a user and design problem. So like some, it's something I'm actually trying to address with um, my next company, um, and then you know the other part of that is is uh, is just general like uh, the disservice that I think people who report on this have done to the space is enormous. And I also think that um, the sort of slapdash way that people um, uh, sort of opine and, and present themselves has been um, also very disastrous. So uh, you know, in order to fix that, it's incumbent upon people like me, who know a fair amount about the technology, uh, to, to try to make things easier for people to use, but also try to be able to communicate um, these types of issues in, a, in an important and, and clear way. Um, so hopefully, we'll get more of that, right? So where should people go if they want to learn more in a clear and sophisticated way? 
Um, I'm a really big fan of the MOOC that came out of Princeton University. I think it's on like Coursera, but they also have a book that's published online. Um, I'm, I'm deaf in one ear, so like I try not to listen to things I try to read. So the book is online, and it's from Arvind, uh, whose last name I would butcher if I would try to pronounce it. Um, but it's pretty easy to Google. So that's my favorite introductory primer. It doesn't dumb things down, and yet it's very accessibly written by um, a team of cryptographers. OK, so we'll, we'll find out what the name is, and we'll send it to everyone. Um, um, I want to go to the iPad. Um, and something seems to have happened here. So you said something about block blockchain should be applied in a smart way. And we have a, a, a very upvoted question asking, where shouldn't block blockchain technology be applied? Should not. Um, well, I have an opinion. Do you, do you want to? Yeah. You can go first. OK. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think in general, uh, blockchain shouldn't be used for medical health records right now. That would be a bad idea. Um, I think that basically a lot of sensitive information um, is probably something you don't want to expose to right now, because we just don't know um, the scale of some of the attacks that are going on um, in public blockchain networks. Um, so I, I'm pretty vehemently opposed to those things. Um, I also think that. Um, the whole notion of putting a token on an open source piece of software that anyone could be able to access is kind of silly. So like trying to monetize basically uh, running through an open field by saying, please go through this turnstile is kind of silly. Um, so there's a lot of services that are like, you know, a CRM that you could just download locally and just use yourself without any um, network effects kind of pulling out from there that people will try to like tokenize and put an ICO on. I think that's kind of silly. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh incentivizing the sales of personal data that must not happen especially in the NGO social impact world so we see some uh, platforms popping up where they say okay if you share your data with me we're gonna give you a token uh, in vulnerable communities there might be an incentive to sell this data and not share it so there's a difference between sharing the data and selling it uh, so yeah, this is the silver uh, silver lining for me. Second thing is, like I kind of disagree with with Kathleen on this. Like, we cannot realize the full potential of blockchain cryptocurrencies, whether in its financial applications or non-financial applications, except when you go live. So you can build as much as you want in your private repo, and you can test on a private chain. The moment you go live is that is the moment of truth. And there is always the incentive for attacking the network. The Bitcoin network is under attack every second of the day. But the resiliency of proof of work and the resiliency of the technology that it supports protects it. So will that happen for EOS, for Ethereum, for Tezos, for any type of blockchain? It's just a question that we can answer in the future. But the incentives to attack it and bring it down is always there. And we, cannot, we can never know if it is solid or not until you go live. Got it. So another interesting and well-voted question. Could you add rules about distribution of crypto that would address income inequality forever? Um, yeah, I mean, like uh, the only investor in my company, Dynamic Ledger Solutions, is this guy, Tim Draper. And he's sort of, uh, he's a libertarian's libertarian, and yet he thinks that like one of the killer apps for this is uh, universal basic income. Um, the problem is, you know, obviously verification and things like this, you have to have like a strong identity layer, so on and so forth. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's completely feasible, and, and, uh, and it's a provocative idea. Any thoughts, Tay? Uh, actually, we are working with the uh, Dutch Red Cross on what we call cash-based algorithms. So we try to determine who needs aid at this moment more than anyone else. And this has gone in what we call the fair cash distribution algorithm. So if we have a single mother with three kids, or if you have a mother whose brother is alive and her husband is alive, who needs cash more at this moment? So. Yeah, cash distribution or financial distribution algorithms can really help in that. Okay, I have one final question. It's sort of a yes, no for each of you. Is ensuring blockchain, is ensuring that the blockchain is used for good mainly a culture mission of the tech sector or are there other practical solutions? So is it mainly a, cult, uh, a culture mission or yes or no? Um, I'll let you answer that first. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a yes or no question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, if I have to choose uh, yes or no, the answer is no, 
because there is more beyond than the culture and the social impact. Uh, you cannot just define or you cannot box blockchain in a, in a, in a, in a certain title or it's only used in, in that sense. I chose to use it there because simply it is my story. It is where I started from and it is easier to convince and relate investors to put money in our platform and put money in our technology because at the end, it's the story and the brand that wins, like Apple, like Coca-Cola, and like everything else. All right, Kathleen, tell me why it's not a yes or no question in 20 seconds or less. OK. Um, yeah, I think for good people to good, do good things and for bad people to do bad things, like blockchain technology offers different incentives and certainly different capabilities. Um, and I think Im imbuing a culture within an ecosystem is like an, an extraordinarily difficult uh, proposition. And it's even worse when it's like highly decentralized and basically synonymous. Um, so I think it's an experiment, right? And I, I can only do so much in my, in my role as a founder of a project, but um, certainly trying to like uh, set a tone is something that's like hard and amorphous and it might not even be possible in such like a crazy you know such a crazy age but like the internet sort of culminated on different norms in different places where like there was badness and goodness and i think blockchain technology will kind of yield the same result awesome thank you guys for joining us Thanks. both of them came to get, getting to here was like a, an act of some divine intervention the UK government was uh, a bit difficult, but we got him here from Amsterdam, and Kathleen came in just for our session. So give them both a huge round of applause. Thanks.